Hello, everybody. This is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series. My glasses do not agree with this camera. Um, again, this is Tiffany with the Speak Up and Inspire series, and tonight we are going to have a very, very personal interview with Cedric Sanders, who is going to be sharing with us um, his story <clears throat> of being a victim of an abuse, abusive situation um, in his workplace, and how right now he is ready to speak up and inspire other men to talk about being victims of domestic violence or sexual assault and his mission this year to start speaking more about being a victim and also being an advocate. Next month on March 7th, we are going to be having the Stomp City to City right here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And the goal or the theme of the March Stomp is men are, have been victims too, they can also be advocates. So that is the theme for the March Stomp City to City that's going to be happening in Charlotte. Next week, we are actually this weekend, we are going to have our first Stomp City to City event in Perry, Georgia with Katrina Thomas of Loving Yourself, No More Abuse. So we are very excited to go ahead and jump off the Stomp City to City project in Perry, Georgia with Miss Katrina Next month, we will be here in Charlotte, North Carolina, with our partners, Brandon Chuck Brown and Julius Bishop, as well as Cedric Sanders. These are all men in the community who are advocating for change in the community. So we are definitely looking forward to the March event here in Charlotte. There will be more information on this event tomorrow that I will be sharing. So thank you, everyone who has joined to listen in. And we were going to give about two minutes and then we are going to go ahead and get started so please tune in have a seat i will be watching for your questions if you have any questions for cedric um this is going to be very personal and there's going to be a lot of information that i'm going to try to cover in this interview so i definitely recommend if you have the time to just take the time out for this hour to support cedric um, because he is going to be sharing some very sensitive things and I want to make sure that he has the support that he needs in you. So we are going to go ahead and get started here in about one minute. And thank you for joining us. Yes. So we are going to go ahead and get started here in about one minute. And thank you for joining. Is it on your page? Uh, okay, yes, it is. Uh, Got it. A couple more minutes. You need anything before we start? Hello, Tony. Hello, Miss Irish. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it. Hello, Cat Beautiful. We miss you. Hello, Miss Anne Marie. Thank you for joining to support Cedric. Hello, April. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Miss Katrina, for joining. Really appreciate everybody that is supporting Cedric right now in the Speak Up and Inspire series. Hello, Miss Julia. Hello, Miss Khadija. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. All right. All righty, everybody. So um, we are going to go ahead and start our. Do you want me to scoot over? So there you can scoot over. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Um, so we're going to go ahead and start the Speak Up and Inspire series episode tonight with Mr. Cedric Sanders. Um, Cedric has expressed interest in sharing his story um, and also joining us as advocates to talk publicly about what he um, endured, uh, the trauma that he suffered, and just really wanting to advocate more in the community to help um, inspire other men to share their stories. We are putting together some panels right now um, for men that have been victims who are now survivors and want to be advocates. 
Um, we are also having the March 7th stop next year. Sorry, next year, next month, sorry, March 7th in Charlotte, North Carolina, which I will be sharing tomorrow. And the theme is men can be advocates too. So we hope that you will join us for that to support, um, to support Cedric in his efforts for wanting to become an advocate, speaking up against um, sexual assault and domestic violence. So Cedric, tell us, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, well, I am 33, I'll be 34 next month. I've been a native of Charlotte for a while now. I guess you could say I'm from Charlotte. I'm originally from Raleigh, uh, but I've been in Charlotte long enough to be from Charlotte. Uh, I went to school for graphic design at Art Institute. I got my degree in that, and I am a full-time press operator. I work at a printing plant, um, and then I do my graphic design on the side, 303 Creatives. So, as well as being the creative director for Butterfly Business Project, and you know, being your husband. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably the the biggest honor that he said so far, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. She's lucky to have me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Tell us why is it that now you've been expressing probably for the last couple of months that you want to um, speak up about your story? Why now? Um, well, being just watching Butterfly Visions Project grow into what it has grown into, um, and and seeing how your story and other people's stories inspire other people. Um, uplift them, you know, get them moving, get them to the point where they want to change and they want to do things they need to do to better themselves. Um, and then applying that to myself, I've been battling uh, depression, um, I say, you know, for the last year, year and a half, probably been longer than that or whatever. So it's just uh, now, you know, being in therapy regularly and trying to work on myself and trying to get past this depression um and talking to my therapist about just speaking up being in tune with my feelings being honest with myself and that's how i can grow to be a better person so it's just one of those things that i need to get off my chest so that i can be great so i can be the best version of myself and hopefully it will also inspire others to do the same um when you say others, I want to focus on men because I think it's very important for men to join um, our efforts as women against domestic violence and such. So for domestic violence, I think it's really important that in when we see news, when we see reports and so forth, usually it is men that are the abusers and not the victims. So I think it's important that men come and step forward um, about being victims because women can be abusers too. Um, when it comes to sexual assault, it goes a little bit deeper. Um, a lot of men do not disclose um, being sexually abused um, or being sexually assaulted, being sexually harassed because they might they feel as if other people will see them as weak or might question their sexuality um, or just question their manhood, period, especially when the, the um, aggressor is a woman. Um, so there's so many reasons why it's important for men to speak up about the abuse, abuse that they've been through, um, but I think it's even more important that men are educated about domestic violence, they're educated about sexual assault, um, and they're educated not just about the, the violence that affects women, but the violence that affects men too. Yeah, I would like to add to that, um, especially when it comes to sexual assault, um, you can do your research. There's not a lot of studies about uh, sexual assault when it happens to young men and boys. Just because there's not a lot of instances of it happening doesn't mean it's not happening. There's not a lot of studies on it because it's, you know a lot of people are not speaking up about it. Um, and, and like you said, there's several reasons as to why uh, men or even uh, young boys and young men don't speak up about it, but it doesn't mean that it's not happening. So um, that's 
that's been a big motivator for me as well. Um, I know that there, now, when you said that there aren't a lot of studies, and you're right, there are not a lot of studies when it comes to the effects of sexual abuse on heterosexual men. There are some studies out there, not a lot, not like studies on women or girls, but there are some studies out there about men who have been abused who now identify as gay. Because there's been a lot of um, myths and a lot of um, statements that are made that men or women turn gay because they've been sexually abused. And they've come to find out that that's not true. So there have been um, studies about abuse in relation to homosexuality. But when it comes to the effects of sexual abuse, sexual assault on heterosexual men, you're right. There's not a lot of studies on that. I mean, a lot of people just assume that this is only happening to men in jail. Right. And that's a huge myth. It's, it's, it goes beyond the prisons. So um, I was just looking at research earlier about that as well. <laughs> All right. Um, so why is it why is it that you are just now talking about it? Um I don't know, it's kinda of tough. Uh part of me feels like uh I'm missing something as an adult male, as an adult man. Um, it's like pieces of me that I'm missing and I need to get this off my chest. I need to get this story out so that I can be that who I need to be. Um, I mean, what happened to me is it's been several, several years. Um, and honestly, I thought that it just doesn't affect me anymore because it happened in the past, but um, it still does. and. Um, so I just feel like I need to just keep going. When the abuse happened, how old were you? Uh, I had to be more around 16, 17 years old. Mm -hmm. So I was still living at my mom's house, uh, going to school, on a road student, uh, working, you know, I was driving, so, you yeah. know what I mean? Because this is really personal, I want to ask you, how many people know, before we start, how many people know exactly what happened? Mm. So, um, y'all bear with me. Uh, it's, it's literally a small handful of people that know. Uh, I mean, hell, even some of my closest friends and family, for that matter, don't really know about this uh some of people that i consider my friends that were friends with me during that time they may or may not know um it's been a really long time so they may not remember um they may not know all the details but um it's next to none it's, there's not really a lot of people that know i mean you know but you know, how long ago was that, you know, when I let you know, and it was really tough for me to, that's not something that you disclose on the first date. <laughs> hey, babe, I'm really into you, and, you know, guess what? You know, this happened to me. You know, so um, even, even, you know, and if my mom's watching, you know, she, she knew very little about what happened, and, you know, immediately she felt some kind of way because every parent wants to be there for their child, you know, and, and wants to prevent something like this from happening to the child, but you know you can't be there every step of the way. You know, and some things happen, and um, you know it's just it is what it is. So yes, that's not not a lot of people know about this, and then um, I kind of alluded to this um, was it a couple months ago, mm -hmm. and I mentioned on my Facebook that I was a survivor of sexual assault. And um, I appreciate everybody that actually reached out to me and they said that it takes a lot of courage to admit to something like that, to put that out there. And even you know, a few people told me that I saved their life or, or that it meant something to them 
for me to even say that. And just that alone, you know, makes me feel proud, you know, to, to be able to share my story and to affect somebody in a positive way. So. Well, um, I'm going to ask some pretty detailed questions. So um, if anyone's listening with their children, it's probably not the episode to watch. Um, and I'm also going to ask questions that people are probably going to be thinking um, because I want to make sure that we don't leave this interview with, with misconceptions um, about what happened. So um, can you tell me how the abuse started and just how it started and then we'll move from there? Uh, well, like I said, I was, um, 16, 17 years old, a uh, young man, um, I was pretty on top of my stuff, um, coming up in my mom's house, you know, I was a loner, but, you know, like I said, I was on a road student working, going to school, just, you know, just handling my business, um, and I was working at the time at a movie theater. And so, um, you know, I was making decent money at the time, I guess, you know, for a teenager. <laughs> um, you know, just made sure I could put gas in my car, pay my phone bill. Um, and uh, in working there, uh, the one of the managers that uh, usually worked on the ship that I worked on, uh, met him. And so what would happen is, is when we start our shift, we would all meet and then we would determine who would work the door, who would be ushering, who would be at concessions, who would run tickets. And so, um, you know, in doing this, uh, a lot of times I really didn't want to work concessions. I really didn't want to uh, have to deal with people and money. I really hate doing that. Uh, especially when those situations go sideways. So I really like, you know, doing the ushering. So in this time, you know, me and the manager got real cool. Um, and so he would, you know, make sure that if I wanted to usher, uh, he'd make sure that I was on the usher crew. Um, so, you know, and it's, at the time, like I said, it's just, you know, I'm a people person. You know, everybody that knows me know that, you know, I'm a people person. I like to make people laugh and smile. Um, and, and it's just that kind of energy that I give off. So, um, I mean, he seemed pretty cool. You know, we, you know, got to know each other. Um, and he didn't stay that far from the movie theater. So, um, in turn for, you know, him looking out for me, making sure that, you know, I can, work the position that I want to work, you know, I would, you know, if I was closing, I'd make sure um, I'd give him a ride home, you know, he rode the bus, um, so he didn't stay, stay right around the corner, it wasn't that far, so I would give him a ride home, but we was just, you know, initially, like I said, we was just cool, um, you know, we, we had no issues, you know, we liked some of the same stuff or whatever, so, you know, it was just like having a homeboy at work. Um, okay, let's stop there for a second. Yeah. Um, do you know what his sexuality was at the time? I mean, straight to me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's just, you know, like I said, I'm a young man. This is a, a, a grown man here. Uh, but, uh, I mean, he didn't, you know, he wasn't married or had any kids or nothing like that. You know, he stayed by himself. Um, typically, he kind of stayed to himself. Uh, you know, everybody seemed to like him at work. You know, he was funny. Um, so, I mean, I didn't see no flags. Um, so when did you start seeing some flags? What, what kind of behavior started to occur that was flags for you? Um, I honestly didn't catch any flags right off the bat. Um, there were times where I just, you know, with, with everybody that was working, that it wasn't necessarily fair for me to work. Uh, on the usher crew, so I would have to work concessions or something like that. And in those times, um, some of the other people that was working there before me would uh, just kind of make little jokes here and there about uh, about the manager. Um, 
as you work concessions, there was time where you had to do inventory check. And so they had a separate room that had all the, the candy and the stock. And so, you know, there would have to be one associate and one person from management. They would have to go and they would have to count uh, everything in the stock room. Uh, and they had to use the checkoff list. And so, you know, I guess the first, I didn't catch the sign, but I guess the first sign was that a lot of people didn't want to do inventory check if he was doing the inventory check. Now, it's, I'm not one person that, uh, you know, listen to everybody's gossip and this and that about somebody or whatever. And I, I like to, to make my own judgment of somebody. You know, I'm not just, oh, this for you think this and this or whatever, but you know, I don't know him like that or whatever. So I might not think that same way. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, they didn't want to do it, uh, you know, joking. You know, rock, paper, scissors, like, nah, man, you do it, you do it, all that, but, you know, and I didn't, you know, like I said, I didn't, you know, the people that I was friends with, I was friends with, but when I was at work, I was at work, so it was just like, I didn't think nothing of it, so, you know, like I said, it was one of those signs that I missed, and. Okay, so let's, let's stop. What, what were, what were the jokes about, or what were the things that were being said about him? Um, I mean, it was just like, oh, you know. Well, I don't want to be in candy closet with him or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Something might happen, blah, 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 blah. You know, and like I said, and he never gave me any of those kind of signs. Um, so, you know, at, at first thought, you know, was, I, I kind of jumped to his defense. Like, you know, like, you know, don't talk about him like that, whatever, like, you know. But at the same time, these people that they've been working there longer than me, they might know him in a different light, but, but I'm not just basing my decisions and my choices off of everybody else's judgment. So, um, you know, just thinking back now, like, I, I, it hurts that I missed that sign, you know, but, you know, like I said, I just, I don't go off of everybody's judgments right off the bat. That's just, that's just not me. Okay. So tell us about the first instance that happened. So, uh, we actually did the inventory. Um, we did we did the inventory probably twice before there was an incident. Um, and like I said, when when we did the inventory, you know, there wasn't no problems. It was just it was just like a regular conversation that we had, you know, on the ride home. You know, what I'm saying whenever I would give them a ride home, um, so. But, you know, like I said, it just seemed like an everyday thing. You know, we talk about music. Uh, we talk about what's going on in the world, you know, stuff like that. Um, so there wasn't really, you know, like I said, there were no flags in me or whatever. And every time, you know, inventory came up, and it was just like it was the same thing. But, you know, like I said, I did inventory twice at this point, and, and there were no issues. So, you know, I didn't mind going ahead and, and, and doing the inventory with them. Uh, so... The third instance of the, when we had to do inventory. And there, it wasn't like there was anything leading up to this. So this is why it just definitely caught me off guard. Um, so when we go into this this closet where everything is, the door has to lock. Um, now, he's the manager, so he has the key to this door. So usually if somebody's holding the clipboard checking off everything somebody's actually counting so i'm holding the clipboard and uh, i'm checking off as he's counting and we're just having a regular conversation at this point um just just like any other time and um uh, i'm not sure how it really kind of happened after that um i heard a noise and i almost tripped over a box and um you know, when I kind of caught my footing and I stood back up, you know, he was like right here on me, you know, and I'm like, okay, kind of close. Like, I need you to back up. All right, let's, let's finish this inventory. Like I said, didn't think nothing of it. Um, but then, again, you know, it was something, and I'm not sure, like I said, what happened. I don't. I don't feel like I gave him any kind of signs or anything, but you know, he just felt like it was okay to, to come up and, and, and touch me inappropriately, you know. So like as soon as he 
as soon as he did, you know, I immediately pushed him off, like, yo, like, what's 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 your problem? Like, we don't we don't, we don't do that, we don't get down like that. And um Um Do you mind me asking you asking where he touched you? Oh, um, so he had put his he had put his hand on on my thigh. And so like I said, as soon as as soon as it happened, you know, I just swat his hand off or whatever, like, yo, like you don't don't do that. You know, and so he immediately was like, Oh, my, my bad man, I you know, I, I ain't mean to do that, blah blah, you know, and, and like I said, he had never gave me any any kind of thought that he was that he even rolled like that. So um I don't know. So it was just like at this point I'm I'm ready to to roll. I'm ready to, to get out. Uh you know what I'm saying? I don't even want to finish inventory. Um but he was letting me know that like we have to finish this. We have to get this done on our shift. And like I said I was just uncomfortable at that point. Um and, and it kinda hurt because I truly thought that, like, you know, this is my homeboy. You know, we cool, and I defended you to everybody else that's making these jokes and this and that and the third that I work with. You know, and everybody's looking at me different because I'm I'm the only one that's okay with going through this inventory with you. You know, and I'm not listening to what they gotta say, and then to do something like that, it's just like. It's like a betrayal um, because a person like me, like I'm really, I give like 150% into my friendships. Um, you know, especially if it's to the point where I'm giving you a ride home and, you know, and I'm telling you things that I don't tell other people, you know, so it just, it just felt like the ultimate betrayal, you know, and it's, it's a small space, you know what I'm saying, in this inventory closet. So, I mean, it could have been like an accident, but at the same time, it's like, and that's what I was telling myself. I was telling myself that maybe it was an accident, maybe, you know what I'm saying, because it was close space, like he just did it on accident. And it's kind of like, because he was my friend, that I was making these excuses for him, you know, and, and that was my way of trying to make light of it. You know what I'm saying? The fact that this just happened. And so, you know, anyways, and I, I let him know, like, that I was uncomfortable, that I need to get out. And, um, and he opened the door and he let me out. Um, and then I was, I was a little messed up, um, after that, um, Um, I was able to finish my shift. Uh, I had to close that night. Um, you know, he had to get somebody else to finish the inventory for him. And, um, you know, I didn't say anything to anybody um, at that point. You know, for the rest of the night, I was just kind of to myself. And, um, you know, on the closing night, I agreed that I would give him a ride home. And the whole night, the whole rest of the night, I was just contemplating on like, am I gonna say something to him? Am I just gonna leave him stranded? You know, like, I don't know, it's just everything was running through my mind. Like, I still just didn't, just like unbelief that if that's what happened, happened. Um, so let's stop here for a second for a couple of questions and to give you a moment to breathe. Um, you said you didn't tell anybody, right? No. But you were quiet for the rest of the evening. Did other people know that you, it was your turn in the closet, the inventory closet with him? Yeah. Okay, so when you came out of the closet and you, you don't hide your emotions very well, um, and I can't imagine you being, you know, any different at 16. Did anybody 
ask you if you were okay? Did anyone ask you, are you okay? Especially after there had been things said about going into this closet with him, and then now you're coming out quiet the rest of the evening. Um, no. Um, nobody actually asked me. Um, the first two times, you know, when I went in there, like I said, I was more of like a new employee or whatever. So, um, you know, people would ask and joke and ha ha, you know, like, something happened to you in there, y'all was in there a long time, or whatever, you know what I mean? And, and like I said, after the second time, or whatever, nobody really said anything. It was more so as long as they wasn't going. Uh, and it was it was a real lax job, honestly, or whatever. You know, on the, the busy days when it was a real busy movie coming out, uh, you know, we have rushes, but, you know, it was like crews, real tight crews, whatever. So, you know, those people was clicked up. Like it was like it was middle school, um, so no, you know nobody really said anything to me. I was on usher duty, so um, uh, well I switched. I was initially in concessions, you know, and then after that I switched. I went to another manager, and you know asked to switch with somebody to do usher duty. So you know with usher duties, it's you know literally when the movie's out, you, know, you sweep the aisles, um, make sure you pick up any trash, any objects, throw it in the trash, anything lost or found, you turn it in. You know, and it's real quick. You kind of go to the next movie, but there's gaps. So then you have to kind of wait for a movie to end, you know, and then you clean it up. So there was you no know, gaps in there where I could be, you know, to myself and nobody would really question. So that night you stopped doing concessions and you asked the manager to do something else that same evening? Yes. Okay. And did they ask you why? Um, no, they, not really. Um, like I said, uh, the, there's clicks that was clicks there, or whatever. Um, and it was a real lax nice job. So there's people that wanted to do ushers. There's people that wanted to do concessions. There's people that wanted to do tickets. And obviously, everybody can't get what they want. So you know, it's just okay. You end up here. You end up here. But at, at any point in time, there's always somebody that wants to change. That wants to do something else. And they typically don't, you know, allow it. But you know, if there's somebody that's willing to switch, then, you know, they just let it ride. Okay. So then there was another instance. Tell us about that. <sighs> so, um, kind of to go back to that particular Oh, yes, evening, let's go back. Um, did you take him home that evening? I did give him a ride home. Uh, and it was, uh, it was just really awkward. Um, at first, he, he just, at first, he was just trying to, like, kind of talk to me, like, any other day, like, like, it almost didn't happen. And, um, uh, it was just, back then, or whatever, you know, as far as, you know, me, and, and I know I don't have the facial expression or whatever, I don't hold it very well, but back then, I actually could hold it very, very well, you know, so, um. It's just I wasn't really saying much, you know. And so when he noticed that I wasn't saying much, you know, he just, you know, he kind of offered his apology about, you know, what happened. Um, and then he was just like, no, nah, he was like, you know, it's not like that or whatever. He was like, you know, we, you know, we used to cool, right? And so I just, I really didn't know what to do. Um, but I was just like, you know what? Yeah, he's still cool. You know, still gave him a ride home, and that was probably the longest drive home ever. After that, because um, this is, I lived probably about twenty five minutes away from my job, and it, it was just the longest drive ever. Um, didn't say nothing to my mom about it. Didn't say nothing to my brother or my sister about it. I, I didn't mean to tell my friends or, or anybody at school. Uh, I just didn't know what to think. You know, like I said, this is to a person like me that really cherishes their friendship. It's like the ultimate betrayal. And I just, you know, and then on top of that, this is, this is somebody that's my manager. You know what I'm saying? So it's not, 
it's somebody it's just my friend or whatever that I can just all right, well, I ain't gotta rock with you no more or whatever. It's somebody I gotta work with every day. It's somebody that tells me what I have to do every day. You know, and and so I just that was a lot. I really didn't know how to handle that. And I think the other part that really makes it worse in all of this is and I grew up in the home without my dad. So my mom was like the mom and the dad. And I know that's a lot to put on her. And mind you, you know, she had boyfriends and they would always kind of help kick in or whatever, you know, so to try to fill that void. But it's nothing, nothing like having that person, your dad, your father, you know, to show you those things that a dad and a son are supposed to do. So it's just like in a situation like this, and I can't go to my dad about it. You know, and, and granted, I could go to my mom about everything. But I, I just didn't know how to come to my mom about something like that. I'm, I'm 16, 17 years old, you know. And it wasn't a real question of my sexuality or whatever. I was definitely in the girl. Um, but how do you explain something like that? And this is your manager. And I know that if I was to break that off to my mom, she would turn that at that place inside out, you know, but it's just at the same time, like this is my friend. And so like so many things was going through my head, you know, and the what ifs, you know, like what if he kept going, you know, we're locked in a closet. You know what I mean? Like, and, and he has the key, so I can't get out without him or whatever. You why, know? Does, why does the door need to be locked? To do that's, that's, they lock that door or whatever, so people can't just open it and steal inventory. That They, they keep everything in there. Well, I, I understand it being locked when you're not in there, but why was it locked when you're in there? I mean, it's just, it automatically okay. locks. Okay. But, I mean, that's where they keep everything or whatever, you know, so um, but it's, it's you know, like all of this stuff is going through my mind. Like that could have been ten times worse. You know what I mean? And, and what am I to do? I'm I'm sixteen, seventeen years old. Mm-hmm. This dude is at least three or four times my size. So at this point, you tell nobody. You don't tell your your mom. You don't tell your brother, your sister, your friends. Did you tell anybody? No. For how long? Uh. Oh, man, um, it was it was probably some months before I said anything remotely anything. And uh, who was the person that you disclosed to after a couple of months? My brother, my older brother. So your mom and you and your mom are really really close. What was, what, if you remember, what was the main reason why you didn't tell your mom? Um, I don't really know. Um, I didn't want judgment, one. And, um, like, two, like, the real, the, the big thing is I felt like it made me less of a man. Because as a man or as a young man, that I should have, you know, I, like I should have fit in myself or, or, you know, I shouldn't have been in that position for something like that to happen to me, you know. But then the, the, the you know, the other side of me is that at the same time, I am still, I am a young man. I am born, I am learning. So the other part of me is like, why you pick me? You know, and it's just like, this is somebody I consider a friend or whatever. So it's, it's just, now I'm I'm really looking at myself like why he picked me out of everybody else, you know what what did I say or what did I do for me be, for me to be this person mm-hmm. and and it just hurt. Well, I want you to know that all those questions and all those feelings are normal. Because um, 
I was assaulted and raped by someone that I considered a friend. And so I felt the betrayal. I felt the hurt. I felt the confusion. I, I had all the same questions that you just said. So all of those feelings are normal, even for women, to, to want, want to know, what did I do to bring this on? You know, should I have done something differently? Why did the person choose me? These are all normal questions that victims ask themselves and they feel, and even the reasons why you didn't say anything. I know the person that raped me because I knew him. I thought the people were not one, not going to believe me. And then two, because we knew each other, that they would use our friendship to kind of justify that we actually had a sexual relationship when we never did before he raped me. So those feelings are normal for a victim to ask themselves. It's just like I didn't want to say that, and I didn't think anybody would believe me. And, I, and you know, my mom loves me, you know, and, and she always has my back, even my brother. But I didn't think that they would believe me either. And then it's like, what do I say when number one, everybody that's working there, kind of already made the jokes about it already. So it's just like, you know, it's almost like I set myself up, you know, and so I'm out really hard on myself about what I'm supposed to do. And I didn't, at the time I didn't really have like a role model that I could go to about stuff like this. You know, at the time with my brother, you know, my brother had my back thick and thin, but, you know, he was kind of going through stuff, you know, and then the, the gang life, it kind of really took control of his life at that point. And, you know, he was spending a whole lot more time in the streets than he really was at home. So it was just like, this is the, the one person that I look up to. And I, I can't come to, to him with this, you know, I'm, a, I'm like a punk, you know, like, Oh, this happened to you, and you ain't do nothing. You ain't fight them. You ain't, you know what I'm saying? Hold it down in there, or whatever. You know, and and again, granted, this I was probably a little taller than this guy, but he was every bit of three to four times bigger than me uh, on any day. You know, and, y'all are locked in the inventory closet, and, and <laughs> it had to be pretty intimidating. Uh, and he's your manager. But that this is not it. Tell us about the next instance that happened. So, time goes on, and um, I tried to let it slide. I tried to just act like it didn't happen. And, um, you know, work was work. You know, I was still give him a ride home. Um, it just wasn't as often as as I was before. You know, and I was trying not to make it so noticeable that I'm trying to create my distance because I didn't want there to be any issues, any words between me and him. At the end of the day, this is the same person that's making my schedule. It's the same person that's allowing me to work, you know, the position that I want to work when I come into work. So, um, you know, every, everything was just going the way it goes. Now, granted, I didn't do any more inventory after that. Um, and I, I, I let him know that, you know, I'm, I'm cool on that. And, you know, he, he let that go. Um, so, that, you know, Again, it's not a big deal. Okay, we all on kind of the same page here. Um, there was another night I closed and I had to give him a ride home. Um, the road that was construction on the, the main road that I used to 
to get home. Like I said, he lived right around the corner, so it was like somewhere like eight to ten minutes to get him home. Um, and at this point, like we had worked, we had closed. Like I said, so it was late. You got to think that the last movie gets out. It's like 1.45, 1.50 in the morning. Um, so a lot of us are kind of hang out after work, whatever, just laughing and stuff like that. Um, so it's, it's probably going on like 3 o'clock in the morning at this point. And uh, it was road construction. So I had to take a longer route to get him home. Um Hard, I thought. Um, so in the midst of uh, giving him a ride home or on the road, I forget what we was talking about. He was laughing. You know, everything was cool. And um, for whatever reason, he decided to reach over and put both of his hands on my thighs while I'm driving. Now I'm driving. You know, at this point, and I'm stuck in traffic, so it's it's not like it's a whole lot that I can do. And this is a, a way bigger guy, um, so when he do it this time, <sighs> he ain't let go. He kept kind of. He had like a tight grip and um yeah he kept touching so I'm trying to drive and so I'm using my one hand to try to get him off of me but I'm still like I said it's not at a point where I can't where I can pull over. Uh, I'm still trying to drive, so I'm driving with one hand. I'm trying to get him off of me with the other hand. <laughs> I finally got to a point where I can apply the brakes. And I punched him in the face. He finally let go. What was he holding on to? Or what was he touching? He was touching my thighs and he was trying to touch my general area and like I said this is a bigger man he's like four times bigger than me so you know obviously he's stronger you know got big hands and like I said I'm trying to drive so you know it's, it's hard for me to really fight him off um, but when I got to a chance where I could apply the brakes and I punched him I punched him in his chin and he let go with one of the hands. When I was able to put the car in park, I pushed him and then his other hand let go. And I kept pushing him and I told him, get out, get out of my car, get out of my car right now. And he was kind of looking at me funny, like, Like he was confused. And like at that point, I was over it. <sighs> I kept telling him to get out. I reached over and I opened the door and I literally pushed him out. And I kept pushing him out until he actually fell out of the car. <sighs> I didn't even shut the door. As soon as he was out the car, I stepped on the gas, pulled off. Eventually, I turned the corner and the door kind of shut. This is a 1990 Honda Accord. So he just kind of shut on his own. And um, I just drove. I 
I just kept driving. And I finally ended up making it home. He had tried to call me a couple times, but I wasn't answering. At the time, my mom was on night shift, so she wasn't um, she, she wasn't at home. My brother was out hanging with his gang buddies and stuff, so he wasn't at home either. At home, and I took like a, it was every bit of like a forty minute shower. I felt disgusting. And every bit of me that was thinking, okay, we got over this stuff that happened in the, the closet and whatnot. I felt stupid. I felt stupid for remotely even trying to be cool with him and give him another opportunity just to set myself up again. And I was just wondering why. How did your night end? Uh, I didn't sleep. Like I said, I took like a 40 minute shower. And um, I just kind of sat up in bed. By the time my mom got home, um, it was basically time for me to go back to school. And me being an honor roll student, I never missed school. I never skipped school. I was in all of my classes, front row, you know, top grade, 3.9 GPA type. That was the first time that I even skipped the class. I went to school, but it was a, like a PE and gym. And then it was another class after that. I can't remember what it was, but I skipped them both. It was still like a long lunch. That was the first time I ever skipped class before in my life. Now, so this is another occasion where you your behavior changes. Did anyone ask you what was wrong? A lot of people, a lot of people asked me what was wrong or whatever because that was so different for me to not be in class, to not show up to any of my classes. Um, I, just, I mean, I didn't really say anything. I didn't really say anything. And at this point, now you still haven't told anybody about the first incident, and now you still haven't told. Now you haven't told anybody about the second incident. Right. So what happened the next time you went to work? Uh, so the next two days that I was scheduled, I called out. I knew he was working. I knew I was going to have to close with him. I called out, and I was only. So many times I was going to be able to do that because at the same time I needed money. You know, that's what I'm working for. Um, so we kind of go into another week. I'm back at work. And, uh, you know, he's still, he's acting like nothing happened. You know, I come to work and this old, you know, he had like a handshake. He tried to dap me up. Uh, this and third, or whatever, and I just, I was just like, no, uh, okay, you know, I spoke, and um, he spoke back, and um, I, I just, that was it. Um, so he would put me down to work the position in the ship that I wanted to work, and you know, I would do it, but I just, you know, just kind of stayed to myself. You know, I didn't really do much. And, you know, he kept asking me, you know, why, you know, why you not talking to me? You know, why this, why that, whatever. And I was just like, well, I, just, I don't have nothing to say. 
you know, I, I'm still going through the motions, still not speaking in the lab, still haven't told anybody what happened. So just being, you put yourself in the position of a 16, 17-year-old that's got something like that they hold it on to and, um, and not being able to get that out. So, um, a couple weeks go by, right? Like that. I'm not giving him a ride home. So, of course, you know, it's, hey, man, you got, you got me on the ride home tonight? Nah, man. You know? So, he was still trying to talk to you, still trying to dap you up, still talking to you as if nothing had happened. Yes. What did that do for you? Because I don't, I don't, I don't know if I could have. I don't know if I could have continued going to work, needing money or not. And I don't know if I could have been in his space. So how was that for you, trying to push through, knowing that you needed to work or wanting to still work, but then having to deal with him acting like everything was okay? Like, how did, how did that affect you even more than what happened? But that had to have even more of an effect on you. Um, I don't know, it was just like, I was still kind of in shock. Like, how in the hell can you come to work every day knowing that you pulled that stunt and, and be all in my face? Like, we cool, you know? Um, Did you ever ask him that? No, I, I try to avoid as much conversation with him as possible. You know, and of course, again, you know, the, the guys that I'm working with still got they they jokes, you know, this and that. Uh, and and I said I'm not really saying nothing, but after a couple of weeks at this point, um, some of the guys are noticing that me and him are not vibing like that. Mm-hmm. And he was like, man, what happened? I thought that was your boy. Now y'all not really talking like that or whatever. And, and I just I didn't have anything to say. Right. And I definitely wasn't ready to say that to any of them. Um, you know, I didn't want to get nobody in trouble, you know, at the same, you know, growing up young, and it's like, you know, ain't no snitch. You know, and, and so that was a, a big thing or whatever, you know, and especially with my brother being my role model, that was one of his big things. I was like, no, nah, I'm like, we will snitch. You know, so I'm just like, no, nah, I just, I don't know who to talk to. And I don't trust nobody. So, like I said, a couple of weeks it went by. This was a particular day. I can't remember what movie it was. That was a big, big movie. You know, a lot of people there. Um, and so I'm on usher duty. You know, with the usher duty, there's there's two different sides to the theaters. There's one side, there's another side of whatever. So um, I'm on a one crew or whatever, but I'm not on the crew that I'm normally with. Um, I'm not I'm not with that same crew that I was normally with. So now I can tell that he picked up on me acting funny towards him. And now it's kind of like that he's doing it back to me. Now, it's not a lot that I can do because this is the manager we're talking about. So he's got me on this crew with some people that I don't really rock with. So there's tensions as we're doing the theaters. Um, and uh, the particular guy I got into it with, this guy with dreads, and, and he wasn't really doing any work. Now, if we're cleaning the theater out, it's probably about four to six of us, right? It's four to six of us in there. So, you know, everybody's got brooms, everybody's got baskets, whatever, you know, we're, we're cleaning, everybody's doing work. And this guy, whatever, he's just, you know, not doing no work, you know, he's doing his little freestyle thing or whatever. And I just, I've always had an issue with him. So it's just like, I'm not about to be over here busting my ass, working hard, and then you're the only one that's not. But you get paid what I get paid or whatever, you know, so how fair is that? So we end up getting into words, whatever. We end up getting into like a little squabble. You know, we ain't nobody punched nobody, but you know, we just you know kind of wrestling a little bit, and uh, everybody broke it up. Um, 
there happened to be some people in in the theater uh, that saw it. So of course they came out and they told the general manager. So when we come out, now the general manager has all of us section off and you know, it's like, hey, I need to talk to everybody about what happened. So, you know, I'm like, I didn't throw the first punch, you know, what I'm saying? Like, like I said, it wasn't really any punches, whatever, but like I didn't start it. So, you know, I'm like, I'm not worried about what's going on. So we're looking at the general manager, you know, he's pulling people individually to talk to. And I see the manager that I've had issues with. Now he comes out and he's talking to the general manager. So I'm thinking that, you know, we still cool, you know, like, you know what I mean? He's spoken to me or whatever. Like, I'm not speaking to him as much. I'm not giving him a ride home. But, you know, we still cool or whatever. So I'm like, he's had my back on everything else, whatever. He's going to have my back on this, you know. And But why did you think that you were still cool after what happened? Um, I mean, because he still spoke to me like he was cool. I still was able to get, you know, the ushering positions that I wanted. Um, and like I said, you know, that we would, you know, we wasn't speaking like as much as we were before. But we still, you know, we still spoke, you know. So I'm thinking, you know, it's just. You know, I would be cool, but it's just like, I just can't rock with you right now, whatever, you know, because of what you did, you know, but I'm thinking that at the same time, even though I feel like you portrayed me as a friend or whatever, you know, we've been real cool, like, you know, beyond this work thing, whatever, you know what I mean? We, we're, we're cool like that. You've always had my back on any and everything whenever it came down to this job. And so... They looked at me and they called me up. And uh, so the general manager is is talking to me and he's asking me about what happened. So I'm telling him what happened, you know. And so he tells me to step back. He's talking to the manager that I have issues with. And so I'm expecting him to kind of have my back, you know, on this or whatever. I get called back over there to where they're at. And the general manager says, hand me your vest and bow tie, you're fired. So I'm looking at the other manager, my friend, or my so-called friend. I'm like, really? You're not going to help me out here or whatever? You know I didn't start that. You know me. He goes, I don't know you like that. But you heard what he said, hand over your bow tie and your vest. And I'm, I'm shocked all over again. Why are you shocked? Why, I don't know, why did just, you think at this point that he would protect you after what happened? I don't know. It's just part of me is like, you know, we was, we was boys, you know what I mean? And, and, and so it's just like, I was shocked, but then it's kind of like it was expected to. But I'm really thinking that, He's gonna have my back, but did you think he was gonna have your back because of the friendship, or did you think that he was gonna have your back because of what he did? Kind of both, honestly. Um, because I mean, let's be real, I could have brought that to the general manager and we could have turned that placeholder upside down. Now, keep in mind, this is weeks after this has happened, so I could turn them in at any point. You know, honestly, I could have turned them in at any point and, and had plenty of, of evidence and information or whatever to back me up, not to mention that everybody at work is already saying this stuff, yeah. you know, and I feel like because I didn't and all that time went by that um, that's why I was figuring like, okay, you, you will still have my back on this particular situation. Um, but no, he didn't. And um, I just kind of looked at him like, dude, from what you did to me, and you can't have my back on this? And I didn't say that or whatever, but that's the look that I gave him. I'm like, dude, seriously? So I took my bow tie, and I threw it at his feet. Took the vest off, and I threw it at his feet. Not the general manager, him. I walked out. I walked out. And, and I just left. I was pissed. I was super pissed. But like I said, I hadn't told nobody. 
I hadn't told nobody about what happened. And um, so. so. So now he's betrayed you not once, not twice, but now three times. Why are you still not saying anything? I was, I, I was scared. What were you scared of? I was scared. Um, because, you know, like, I felt like I was less of a man. I felt like, I don't know why I was put in this position. And, I mean, you don't hear too often about men doing stuff like that. I mean, I mean, you do now or whatever. But, like, back then, like, you didn't really hear about stuff like that. And so it's like, man, this has happened to me more than once. You know, why is this happening to me? You know, now I'm I'm really starting to contemplate my whole life. You know, uh, you know what what I could have did to prepare myself better for a situation like this. Whatever. Why was I the victim? Why was I picked? You know, why did I allow this to happen? You know, and and so probably about three or four weeks after that, I finally came to terms and. I told my brother, uh, this is my older brother, I didn't give him all the details. I basically just told him, and I, and, I, and I didn't tell him about what he did to me. I basically told him that, because you know, he knew that I was cool with somebody at the um, at the job, you know, and so this person, you know, he would get, you know, him free movie tickets and stuff like that for his boys and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, I told my brother that, you know, he didn't stand up for me, you know, when I got fired. And I told him about the, the situation that happened and all of that. And, and so... You told him about the situation when you got fired? Yes. So I didn't, I did not tell him about what transpired before that. Okay. Like I said, he, he knew, my brother knew that I was cool with management at the job or whatever because I got some of his homeboys hired on. Mm -hmm. um, but he didn't know about the assault situation. So be before we move, I mean, continue, there was something else that was going on at the job with the manager. Tell us about that. The part with the the ticket thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, a lot of people was cool with this manager because um, we he had kind of this, uh, I don't really know how to explain it, um, this kind of money scheme going uh, with um, old tickets. Mm -hmm. So, that's a kind of a plus of being on the Usher team, you know, we pulled the old tickets. And something he did as well up front was able to basically get money off of it. And then in doing so, split the money with us. Mm -hmm. So I honestly feel like a lot of people was still cool with him because of that. Yeah. And so you think that that, well, and that might have been another reason why no one had spoken up yet. Right. Because it was like hush. Like, right. You keep this on the hush. You, you keep getting paid. You keep getting money. Mm -hmm. Everybody's getting money. You know, so it's all good. Yeah. And um. So there were several factors going on with this manager. Yes. One, he was a predator. He was a pedophile because y'all were children. Um, he was an abuser. He was abusing his power as your manager, and then he was also a thief <laughs> and had. Some of the employees and outside people in this money scheme. So right. he had several things against him, but no one was speaking up. No, I mean, and even even I was on on the money scheme too, or whatever. And and you know, you got a picture, sixteen, seventeen year olds, whatever, and you're in school, and you know, you got to pay for stuff, whatnot, or whatever. Like, you know, who gonna get mad at making some extra money? Um, so I told my brother about the incident, he didn't say nothing for me, etc. My brother came up there, you know, this is, again, you know, this is my older brother, so I looked up to, you know, and, and so he was, you know, full-fledged into the gang life at that point, um, uh, with the Crips. 
So him and the crew, you know, they came up there. Um, they seen him at work. And uh, I wasn't there. Well, you know what I'm saying? But he said that they pressed him, whatever, it roughed him up. And I'm not sure on how it ended. But like I said, after that, you know, I kind of kept asking my brother, like, hey, you know, whatever happened with that? Did you handle that for me? And he was like, oh, yeah, everything's cool. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like, everything's cool, whatever. So, um, you know, come to find out, I guess to save his own ass, he put my brother in the game in on the money scheme. So now they like best friends. So now what? my brother is hanging out at the movie theater, like hanging out with the guy, whatever, you know what I'm saying, this and that. And I'm, and I'm just, I'm like, what in the world? You know what I mean? Like, but, but, but that's I, because you hadn't told him yeah. what else happened. Right. So what do you think would have happened if you would have told him everything? Honestly, I still felt like my brother would have looked at me like you a punk. You know, you you know, you let that happen to you. You know what I mean? And that was a big reason why I didn't tell him, you know? And so it's just like how do I how do I tell my brother that? I don't tell my mama that, you know, and you talk about not just one instance, but you talk about twice. Um, so I didn't, I didn't really say anything. So let's, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, so anyways, um, it all kind of ended pretty fast. Um, you know, the, the money thing or whatever kind of caught up to him. You know, everybody involved had to kind of disperse very quickly so they don't be attached to that. But um, I guess another instance happened with somebody else that worked there, and it went way further than, you know, how my situation is. And um, how much further? Um, so apparently um, he got caught down on his knees, you know, with another employee with their pants down and you know like he got beat he got beat up. You know, so and it was there was witnesses. The guy that attacked the the guy that attacked you was trying to give to another employee. Yes. And the employee beat him up. Yes. Um but there was witnesses. And uh there was witnesses that the abuser, the manager, was kind of yes, yes. There was okay. other people or whatever, you know. And so um, somebody decided to uh, take it to another level. Um, got a lawyer, um, and you know, they wanted to press charge and wanted to sue. And so they went after the, the movie theater itself, and. Uh, long story short, come to find out, this guy had warrant for his arrest back in, you know, in a whole other state for messing with boys. And apparently the theater hired him. He had been working there for years. Mm -hmm. So the theater hired him and they knew about, and it. They knew about it. So once this really kind of took light and they, they, they they went full fledged with the lawyer. Everything folded after that. You know, the management got questioned. They got fired. Some of the people that was involved got fired. Everybody involved in the money scheme got fired. You know, and they just broke after that. You know, and of course, you know, my brother wasn't hanging out with them after that or whatever because you know, they, they literally came and arrested him right at the theater. The manager. Yes. But this was for the money thing and then also the accusations of the employee. Yeah, well, was, they didn't come and arrest him until after the uh, finding out about the warrant thing. Okay. So now all this has happened. You still haven't told anybody. No. So at what point did you have to say something? Um, and how, how long after you were fired did this all happen? So with the um, 
with the lawsuit, um, when they finally gathered all information, they wanted to know about who was in contact with this guy, if anything happened with anybody. Um, but they needed, they wanted proof. They wanted everybody's stories. They wanted everybody's testimonies. And so, you know, and, you know, right off the jump, you know, like I said, this is, again, these are 16 and 17-year-old boys. Some people are the ones that were joking about, oh, I'm not going in, in closet with him and stuff like that. Now everybody's got a story, you know, but the story had to be verified, you know. And so, you know, fuck some people was just trying to get on the money train, honestly, you know. And um, I guess a, a couple of people got interviewed and somebody mentioned my name. And they mentioned how close we were and stuff like that or whatever, and that I would be a person of interest to talk to. Um, after everything, to, to put everything together and everything to get rolling, um, it took probably about two to three years for them to really kind of get that together. Okay, so from the time that you got fired to the time the investigators or whatever came to you, how much time was that? That was like two years. So it was about two years before. Yeah, because I was, I, was I was in college. Okay. I had already started college. When um when I got the phone call, um about needing to do my testimony, and during um, this whole two years, you never told me. That. Never told my mom. I never completely told my brother. Um, you know, didn't go to therapy or anything like that. I really just tried to tuck it away. Um, and I didn't say anything. Um, and then it wasn't until. This investigation thing came up. Like I said, I'm a brand new fresh in college, and um, you know now I'm having to to give my story. You know, in, in a and it was in like a panel format. You know, so one, you know, I don't already I'm in college, so now I'm in Charlotte. You know, I'm not even at home anymore. So I got to come back to Raleigh. Okay, and I got to go to this building, and it's a panel. Format. I got to speak in front of like four people long table they got the recorder out and everything and my mom said with me you know because at the time my mom had to bring me and so so you're not and you're not over 18 at this point yeah yeah but my mom was she had drove me oh okay there or okay. whatever so um now my mom wasn't in the room and i had to do all of this but i had to basically kind of tell my mom what's going on and i, I gave her a very short generic version because I really I, I still wasn't at a point where I'm ready to talk about that or I'm ready to explain that. You know, so I was just very generic with her. Um she mentioned she knew I was okay, nothing happened and um you know, but after that I had to give her a little more than that. She was not letting that go. Right. I would, um, I would either. <laughs> so you know I, I'd only told her <laughs> about the candy closet incident um, and I did not tell her about the car incident and honestly um, until the other day I had told her so it was that a couple months ago when I had mentioned that I'm a sexual assault uh, survivor mm -hmm. she called me immediately and she was just in shock and I wouldn't be surprised if she, there might have been some tears and she was just telling me about wishing that she could have, could have done something and wishing that I would have told her, you know, but I think she understood why I couldn't tell her something like that, yeah. you know, and it was like my sister. You know, and I don't know if my sister or my brother is watching or whatever, but like I said, I, I never really came out and told my brother everything. You know, I didn't tell my sister any of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and uh, you know, a lot of my friends and family, even my best, my best friends, they went to school with me. They don't know nothing about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, let's, let's go, let's, you're how old now? 
33. So let's go back. You're 16, 17 years old. You're working at McDonald's. And this happens with the manager. What would you do now? What would you do differently? Or would you do anything differently? Do you think if you were 16, 17 now in today's age where these reports are now more publicized, do you think you would do anything differently? Oh, yeah. I mean, I... I I'm Not knowing of, what you know now as an adult, but as a 16-year-old boy, do you think you would have done anything differently if you were 16 right now? Not knowing what I know now? Like, in this present time, with the way the world is and the way the reporting has been about men and so being victims and so forth and so on. Because you said back then, you didn't hear a lot about men abusing boys and men as much as you do now. So, as a 16-year-old boy... Right now, in today's society, do you think you would have kept silent? No, I think I would have told somebody. Um, the question is who I would right. have told. Um, just have a lot of trust issues and daddy issues and role model issues. Mm -hmm. It was like, who am I supposed to tell? Um, knowing that my brother will always have my back, knowing that my mom will always have my back. I probably definitely would have told the both of them. Um, and maybe even told, you know, somebody from management. Um, but, you know, just going back to my situation, and even after everything unfolded, knowing that everybody, the management knew about this guy, Imagine me going to them and telling them this, you know, knowing the, the repercussions that it would cost for them, they probably would have laughed in my face or they probably would have been like, I, you know, I got to bring some kind of evidence or something to them. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's... They probably would have covered their own ass. Right. <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I definitely would have said something. Uh -uh. Um, I definitely would have said something. Um, so that, that you shared a lot, um, some things I didn't know, some things I did know. Um, what was the result? What happened to him? Uh, I mean, he got arrested. Um, like I said, I think everybody that was management, um, you know, lost their jobs. Um, and that was kind of it. Um, no, that was not it. What else happened? There's more to it. Management lost their job. He was arrested. Did he serve any time? Yes. So, this is part kind of gets kind of hard for me. Um, he served time and he got out. Um, within the last couple of years. And I mean, keep in mind, I'm 33 now. This is when I was 16, 17 years old. A lot of time has passed. Um, and I hadn't really given it any more thought. Um, I mean, I didn't talk to nobody else about it. Um, kind of just boxed it up and kind of shut it out. And When he got out, now I just I just felt like I was aware that he got out, but I got a friend request on Facebook, and it was him. And this guy is bold. Um, yeah, wow. and and this is really this is really the turning point for me. This is really where it sparked me because I hadn't really been thinking about it anymore. You know, I, I really had just gotta let it go. It was in the past and seeing his face pop up in my friend request, seeing his name. Did you recognize him? He, the picture was exactly the same the same way he looked the last time I saw him. So I don't know if he just used the old picture or what, but 
Just put yourself in my shoes being an adult adult now. And something that you shut away for so long and you see that and it just brings it all back. It brought back the, the closet scene. They brought back the thing with the car. Everything came back. When I seen it, I saw it on my computer. I shut my computer so damn hard. And when did this happen? This is this was this was like a couple years ago. This is not last year, but maybe the year before. Um I slammed my computer so hard. I was like, there's no way. There is no way. How did you find me? You know, and, and everything started coming back. I felt like I was targeted. And because we were so cool, it was like, of course he looked to find me, you know what I mean? And I just felt like it was more than I was supposed to do. And I feel like shit because I didn't. I didn't do anything. I let it happen twice. I let it happen to me twice. You're like, what kind of man am I? Let something like this happen to me twice. Guys, we are going, it is um, past nine o'clock, past our time. Um, I think this is a good place where we're going to stop. Um, we will follow up with part two to Cedric Sanders breaking the silence, talking about being a victim of sexual abuse, and the reason why he feels now is important to speak up and inspire others, especially men. Have a good night, everyone, and thank you for your support. I'm sorry. I'm sorry.